We will welcome two incredible experts that we are so lucky to have in our community. Um, Timothy Denherter Thomas from Cooperative Energy Futures and John Farrell from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. I know as someone deeply involved in this work, I am so thankful that we have their expertise and their passion and their generosity. So take it away. I believe it's just on to our presentation. Thanks so much, Kyle, uh, for that kind introduction. And to all of you who are showing up in an evening to talk about solar uh, outside of regular business hours uh, and in uh, response to some fairly big challenges. Um, I wanted to start with this slide uh, because a lot, a lot of what is useful for understanding what is happening in terms of the threats to local solar goes back over 100 years to when this fellow was working with Thomas Edison on uh, setting up large utility companies. Samuel Insull was Thomas Edison's right-hand man, um, and he is the one who helped to arrange the situation that we have today where we have monopoly private companies that provide electricity service with oversight from public regulators through a public utilities commission or a public service commission. So uh, we owe to this man the fact that we have Excel Energy or Otter Tail Power or Minnesota Power as monopoly private corporations that provide us electricity service. And the trade-off that comes with that, of course, being that that regulation is often insufficient to guaranteeing the public interest. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get through this in terms of how that plays out. But I think it's always really important to start back at the beginning. And the beginning was in the early 1900s as these small businesses began to consolidate into larger utilities um, and to do so uh, with the public blessing of uh, monopoly service. So we can move to the next slide then. Um, I'll bring us forward a little bit. And uh, I'll bring us forward 100 years, actually. And this is to 2013, about 10 years ago. And uh, the Edison Electric Institute is a trade organization of investor-owned utility companies. So all of the ones that I named that are in Minnesota, plus um, uh, about 150 to 200 more across the country, are members of this organization, which uh, performs research, coordinates their lobbying agenda, Etc. And 10 years ago, they commissioned this study called Disruptive Challenges. Uh, if you look for it online, you can still find it. I pulled out a particular quote from it um, just to highlight that one of the key findings of this report for the members of the Edison Electric Institute for these utilities was that disruptive challenges, which included things like rooftop and community solar, uh, were a threat to their business model, a threat to their revenues, could mean increasing costs, lower profitability particularly over the long term. So this, this report was commissioned because solar was really starting to take off in two particular places, in Hawaii and in California. And the utilities there were trying to figure out how do we respond to this? And the outcome of this report was helping to coordinate investor-owned utilities across the country in their response to uh, rooftop and to community solar, which I often just summarize as local solar. So we can go to the next slide bring this up to today. Um, the, what happens these days is that utilities often obscure the truth about rooftop and community solar because of that report 10 years ago, because they know uh, that it presents a threat to them. So utilities will use lots of phrases, lots of words, lots of arguments to say why rooftop and community solar are problematic. But this uh, conversation, which took place in a courtroom in Arizona, last fall uh, uncovers the real truth of it. So this is uh, an attorney for solar companies who has on the stand a witness for Arizona Public Service an investor and utility. And he walks through in his questioning essentially um, this, uh, this line of questioning is essentially lots of customers are doing things like local solar and rooftop solar. And that's a business risk for your utility. Yep. And you'd agree that these you know, investments by customers in rooftop and community solar can replace what the utility might otherwise spend on. Yep. Uh, and that's why utilities oppose them. Yes. And what's remarkable about that is that utilities don't often admit to this being the truth. 
they will say it's about reliability or they'll say it's about saving customers money or they'll even say it's about equity. Um, but what they're really hiding in all of that, these investor and utility companies, is this truth that they can make money by building power plants or building power lines or doing things like that. And if we instead collectively invest in energy solutions for ourselves, uh, we will um, take away from the profits that that utility company can make. I'm going to hand it over to Timothy now, who's going to walk through kind of what's at stake here uh, with this issue uh, with investor and utility companies and their motivations. Thank you, John. And again, thanks for everyone coming out. Um, Timothy Denner Thomas with Cooperative Energy Futures. Um, you know, when we were involved in these fights 10 years ago, uh, a lot of the conversation was really around, are we going to transition to clean energy sources? And I think before we go a lot further, I just want to highlight that we're in a very different conversation today. And the conversation we're in today is how are we going to transition to clean energy sources? And I think it's really important to look at the situation that we're in as, as kind of a fork in the road. Um, and you know, let's recognize that these are not um, two incompatible uh, models, um, but there are some very important tensions. And in the context of monopoly power that John just highlighted, um, what we think of as uh, valuable, fast, efficient, all of these things can be different. So are we going to, in our energy transition, focus on a few large projects that are usually far away from where we use energy and that are generally owned and controlled either by electric utilities or large private investors, uh, as there's a growing number of large private companies doing these sorts of projects and selling their power to utilities? Or is our vision of an energy future more focused on many smaller projects, mostly close to where we use energy, and as much as possible created and owned by local communities, whether that's rooftop solar or community scale projects serving communities. And Kyle, if you can hit the ne uh, next, um, just wanted to highlight again, this is not an either or, we're gonna do some of both, but there's some really important choices that we have to make. And I wanna highlight a few questions that keep coming up in these discussions that I think are really important for us to dig into. First, which of these paths is faster? which is actually going to get more clean energy online uh, rapidly. Which of these paths is more affordable? Um, and, and I think looking at that in terms of cost, both to um, you know, rate payers, people who use energy, uh, and also to society as a whole and, and other hidden costs we don't always look at. And which path is fairer and distributes benefits more equitably? How do we ensure that the benefits of this transition are, are shared and that the costs are not unevenly borne by the people who are most vulnerable. And I, I wanted to highlight these questions because in the conversation that's happening right now, um, you know, one of the most immediate threats that, that caused us to put this together is that um, Excel put forward a proposal to dramatically undercut the compensation that they are paying to subscribers which we now know are either re mostly residents or local governments and other public institutions, only about 30% are private companies. Um, they're uh, proposing to dramatically undercut that compensation for projects that have already been built based on the argument that there is cheaper, more affordable, faster ways to do that and that the approach that has been taken so far is, is really not equitable. And so all of these claims are coming up in uh, the, the advocacy that we're seeing from investor-owned utilities. Um, you know, one of the things that I'll always remember is uh, a while ago, Excel had a campaign that came out, you know, utility-owned solar, big, large-scale, um, you know, moving power long distances is solar done right. And what we want to talk about today is really what's going on under the hood here, recognizing, as John highlighted, that utilities time and time again have opposed alternatives that actually compete with how they how they generate energy. And so before we dig into 
uh, some of those detailed questions, I just want to make sure we're starting from the same place in terms of where we're at. Um, because as John has said, the types of fights that we're having here in Minnesota have happened all over the country. Uh, there have been attacks on net metering and rooftop solar by utilities. Uh, and that's actually, um, you know, one of the concerning things that some of our elected officials uh, have stated around this too, is that it's time not only to revisit compensation for community solar, but also rooftop solar and other key pieces of, of, a, of local solar and distributed energy movement. Before we dig in, if you can go to the next slide, I want to start with something we're probably all clear about, which is that um, clean energy costs have dropped dramatically in the past 10 to 15 years. Um, you know, this is the, the overall levelized cost of electricity from a variety of sources. And uh, solar is that yellow line that starts out, you know, by far the most expensive back in 2009 and is now one of the cheapest energy sources available. Uh, wind is the only one that's actually below it. And you have uh, gas and geothermal slightly above that and uh, coal and nuclear and gas peaker plants massively more expensive. So you would look at this chart and say, oh, you know, this just makes economic sense that we'd switch to clean energy. And in fact, yes, if you go to the next slide, um, over the course of the last decade, the vast majority of new energy generating capacity that has been built in this country is clean energy. It's a lot of wind, and especially in the last few years, it's a lot of solar. Um, essentially, since about 2015, on average, there have been a few exceptions, uh, the vast majority of the, the new power plant capacity that's been built in this country has been clean. Um, and uh, you're actually starting to see in, in many areas uh, net reductions in the amount of uh, dirty energy that's online. Now, um, you would look at these two things and say, clean energy is cheaper. And we're building a lot of it. It's, it's really changing the energy grid. That must mean that energy is getting more affordable. Now, many of you know what's been happening with our energy rates, so the slide will come as no surprise. But if you look at those two things, you know, that's a valid conclusion. If clean energy sources are some of the cheapest energy sources available, and we're building a lot of them, our cost should at least be stabilizing, if not, if not, maybe actually starting to decline. Well, no. If you go to the next slide, here's what our energy prices uh, from utility electricity, uh, sorry, one back, are doing in Minnesota. Uh, they're rising steadily. They're in mo in recent years actually rising fairly sharply. Um, now, some sorry, we're going ahead here. Go back, please. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I want to highlight. There's a couple of reasons for this. The first is energy utilities are compensated uh, not simply based on the cost to generate energy. Energy utilities are compensated based on all of the uh, investments they have made in physical infrastructure, whether that's power plants, whether that's power lines, uh, pipelines from the gas side. Um, you know, there's all of this stuff that the utilities built. And in fact, utilities are allowed to get a rate of return on those power plants and infrastructure they've built, even if they're no longer useful. So one factor that's going on here is as you've had a, a growing volume of old power plants um, that are reaching the end of their life or are actually having to be retired or no longer being operated because well, there's cheaper and cleaner resources out there, ratepayers are still paying for that, that power. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, we also have uh, still have a lot of power plants on the grid that are dependent particularly on gas. And several times in the last few years, we've had massive spikes in the cost of gas uh, that have really cost energy users a lot of money, including here in Minnesota. Utilities have been going on about how uh, local solar, particularly community solar, has been raising costs. Um, but there's a lot of complexity, which we can talk about at the end of the call uh, for those who want to get into it, uh, 
uh, as to how what they're counting um, is really not apples to apples when they're they're looking at um, local solar. Really, all the costs to distribute that and get that to customers are included in what they consider the price. Whereas for more of these centralized projects, uh, those costs to transmit are not part of the calculation. And, and John will talk a little bit more about that later. But in this calculation of what is energy costs, I wanted to highlight that um, in terms of what it actually costs to generate energy, it's not a uniform value. First and foremost, if you go to the next slide, it depends on where that energy is generated, right? We have a grid that has large scale generation, a transmission system that moves lots of power long distances, and then local distribution. If you click next, um, at the distribution scale, um, when energy is delivered to a residential customer, the value of that energy being distributed to that residential customer is about 14 cents. On the commercial end, it depends on the commercial customer, but it's more on the eight to 14 cent range. That's because when you deliver energy to that site, you're paying for everything upstream. Well, if instead you're delivering energy uh, more at the distribution level, uh, if you click the next, um, we, we see a more moderate uh, value of that energy. So at the distribution level, um, energy that's delivered to substations, you know, it avoids a lot of that need to transmit it long distance. It, it, um, it, it's saving a lot on those costs. The value of that energy is somewhere in that mid range, more like eight to 11 cents. If you're delivering energy to the transmission grid, you have to have all of those super expensive long distance power lines and a lot of energy that's generated on like the wholesale market um, that's distributed long distance is somewhere in that three to eight cent range. Now, this is a vast simplification, but I really wanted to highlight that depending on where you're generating energy has a big impact on how valuable it is uh, and how much it costs to get it to the end user. There's a second really important factor here in terms of what energy costs, and this is time. So if you go to the next slide, we can go again. Uh, one more. One more? Yep. Okay, so people use energy at different times of day and different times of year. This is an approximate um, chart. This is actually from a ut utility region more in the Eastern US, but it's roughly similar. Um, our peaks are generally in the afternoon in the summer. We also have a peak more in the winter, but it's not as high as the summer peak. And spring and fall tend to be more moderate times of energy use. And the middle of the night is really the, the lowest energy use time for, for most of our grid. It's expensive to generate power during those high, high usage times of day, because basically the most expensive uh, power plants are operating then. So there's a very high value to energy that's delivered at those times of day. Well, what does solar do? If you can click again. Most solar production is, oh, sorry, one back. Uh, most solar production is in the summer, uh, roughly in the middle of the day, which is not a perfect overlap with that peak, but it has substantial overlap. And there's quite a bit of production in the spring and fall too. So when we're looking at solar energy that's generated close to where it's used, it's both overlapping with very high value times to produce energy, and it's also generating energy at a place that is able to offset a lot of the upstream costs to get that energy to where it's needed. The big takeaway from all of this is simply uh, what it costs to generate energy varies a lot by place and by time. And so if you're having a conversation and the utility is making a comparison simply to the retail rate or simply to a different type of energy that's generated at a different location on the grid or at a different point in time, we're not necessarily doing an apples to apples comparison and we're not looking at the real savings or the real cost uh, to, to generate that energy. And we, there's a lot, of, a lot of complex math that goes into really 
what is the apples to apples comparison, but I wanted to highlight that you, you can't trust those very simplistic comparisons without doing a lot of digging. And as John said, uh, you can't trust utilities to give you information uh, that is straightforward or really providing an apples to apples um, because they have an incentive not to do so. I wanted to highlight a few things that are really about the speed of the transition before I pass it back to John. You can go to the next slide. Um, this is a map of Excel Energy's hosting capacity. Now, essentially what this means is if you look at the existing grid, where does the grid have space to accommodate more renewable energy? And just this visual is a simplification. There's a lot of electrical engineering under the hood, but in general, places where you see a lot of green have a lot of space on the grid and places that are red don't. Now this is just for Excel. So there's lots of parts of Minnesota that are not covered by this map, but uh, everything that's on this map is, is Excel's grid serving customers in the state. And you can get a rough sense of where the grid has space. Now, this is not 100% rule of thumb, but the takeaway to, to, to take from this slide is there's a lot of grid space to add more renewable energy where there's a lot of energy being used, which is in urban areas. You can see the Twin Cities, you can see some green spots in Mankato and Faribault and St. Cloud and a few other areas where there's high density of energy usage. And in most, not universally, but in most of rural Minnesota, um, a lot of the grid is fairly congested. There's already a lot of renewable energy and other power plants in some cases on the grid. And there's not a lot of capacity to add more without building a lot of additional power lines to move that power to where it's needed. And that's expensive. And that often isn't counted when the utility says, this is what it costs to produce utility scale or large scale electricity. That transmission cost to move the power isn't counted. Additionally, building that new infrastructure takes a really long time. Um, this is in the news all the time, the backlog to build new transmission projects and other capacity to move energy long distances is a huge problem for getting energy on the grid when you're trying to do that energy big, centralized, far away from where it's used. And we're gonna have to do some of that, but I really wanna highlight if we think that it's going to be fast to build most of our energy sources far away from population centers, we're somehow assuming that building these giant transmission projects, which often take a decade or longer to finance and construct, is gonna happen in the next two or three years. We're missing a big piece of the puzzle. And this actually plays out in terms of how renewable energy has been developed in Minnesota, if you go to the next slide. This is a chart that is basically showing you annual solar installations in Minnesota of different types. Um, the dark blue at the very bottom is all of the residential solar being built in the state. You can see it's ramping up dramatically and we need to see a lot more of that. The yellow is commercial. So again, this is residential and commercial that is directly powering energy users. There's this huge green chunk that is community solar. And these are larger scale, usually under one megawatt systems that are um, generating energy onto the grid, but they're at a modest scale. They're not accessing the transmission grid. They're mostly accessing uh, the local distribution grid that already has capacity to move power. And you can see a few big pulses, mostly in 2016, 2017, and expected uh, in this case from 2023 and coming up in some new projects that utilities are developing for utility scale solar. But it actually hasn't been as much as the local solar that's been built in the state, whether it's rooftop customer sited or community. And what you tend to see is utilities doing a couple of big projects here and there when they have a lot of 
um, when they have a lot of grid capacity, new new wires to connect that energy in. Um, and I, I wanted to, again, highlight our future is a mix of all of the above. But when you hear an argument that the only way to do solar fast is to do it big and utility owned, the data really doesn't bear that out. That's not what's been happening. And I don't see any reason why that's likely to change soon, given that those really big transmission projects, which are super expensive and cost a lot of money for ratepayers, take a really long time. We're gonna have to do some of that. It's gonna be an important part of the solution, but we need to make sure that the utility isn't able to undercut or cut off the opportunity for local solar that can get here faster and in many ways uh, with greater benefits. I'm gonna turn it back over to John to talk a little bit more about some of those costs and benefits of different types of solar. Thanks, Timothy. Um, on this chart, I'm gonna encourage everyone to ignore the leftmost bar and look at the three on the right, utility scale, high cost model, community and rooftop solar. And the top end of the colors is what matters here. And what we found in our analysis of utility scale and community and rooftop solar is that they all cost about the same to Minnesota electric rate payers. Utility scale solar, when you factor in the delivery costs, the transmission costs that Timothy talked about, which is represented in blue on this chart, costs about the same amount to Minnesota electric customers as community solar, as does rooftop solar. And that's partly because community and rooftop solar by being close to where we use energy actually avoids those transmission and distribution costs. And that energy that's produced locally can help avoid additional costs to expand that infrastructure as we use more electricity. So um, there's a link here. Um, uh, I think the link has also been put in the chat by Kyle, but I just wanna emphasize if you wanna dig in, we've got a brief presentation and then what I call like an expert level presentation that kind of dives into how we got these numbers. But I use the same kind of analysis that the utility has to use when it makes the case to the Public Utilities Commission to recover the costs from ratepayers to do utility scale solar and wants to earn a profit on it in order to figure out what the cost of utility scale solar was to Minnesota customers. And it's a lot more than the utility says when they're being quoted in the newspaper. We can go to the next slide. So local solar is cost effective is the key takeaway there. And it competes very favorably with scale solar at any size. Local solar is also really fast. This is an excerpt from an article that was in Canary Media about the cutting of rooftop solar compensation in California, which you might have heard about. You can see in the chart the nosedive in terms of the amount of rooftop solar that was being developed by companies there uh, in California because they slashed rooftop solar compensation by almost three quarters. What was interesting was this sentence in the article where they had compared the amount of local solar that was being developed in California over the last couple of years to all of the solar that was being developed in California. And funny enough, just like in Minnesota, the local solar was carrying the freight for California's clean energy development. More of the clean energy, more of the solar being developed was actually on rooftops and in neighborhoods than it was in those huge giant utility scale solar arrays. So if we're in a hurry to solve the climate crisis, we really do need local solar to work because it's actually something that can deploy quickly and doesn't rely on those giant infrastructure investments that can take five or 10 years or even more. So we can go to the next slide then. So we know local solar is cost effective, that it's competitive. I'll go one back, thanks for it, that's great. Um, we know local solar is cost effective. We know that it can deploy really fast. Uh, we know it has several other benefits about resiliency, around giving opportunities to own a slice of the clean energy economy. It's actually the least cost path to a carbon-free future because with all of this distributed energy and supplying energy locally, it actually frees up capacity on the transmission system, on the high voltage power lines for some of the big stuff to be built without building those new transmission lines. Um, and we get up to 30 times more jobs for every million dollars we spend on solar when we build it locally instead of when we build it at a huge scale. Uh, next slide, please. I also actually published a, a report, and I think my colleague Katie Keenbaum is actually in the in the uh, participant room here. Uh, she, who, she authored this report called Advantage Local uh, that we published last year. It's available freely on our website, and the last the next two charts here are taken from that. Um, there's a lot of numbers and a lot of things on here. What I want to emphasize is this. If the bars are in color, then they represent 
local folks, maybe co-op members or solar subscribers, local lenders, local landowners or local governments. And the bigger the bar to the right, the more benefit for those folks that are local. And so what we found was that locally owned community solar and especially cooperatively owned community solar, which is what we modeled, brings in far more benefits to the community, almost as much as three times more benefits to the community financially than projects that are not owned locally, that are owned by some outside entity or third party. And on the next slide, we did the similar comparison with both community solar and with rooftop solar and looked at third party owned. So if you were, for example, leasing your solar panels versus if you were able to finance and own them yourself, that again, as much as three times the financial benefit um, and maybe even a little bit more if you're able to have local ownership. So I wanna emphasize this for one particularly important reason, which is there's no local ownership for utility scale solar or for utility scale wind or for transmission lines. So the opportunity to have these benefits rests on being us being able to develop solar in a community scaled way, whether that's in community solar or on rooftops or in our neighborhoods. We have to have that if we want access to these big local benefits. And we're not gonna get that at the utility scale. And as Timothy said, we're gonna to expect to do solar at all different scales, but the utility is out to get it in only one fashion. And what we're trying to say is we need it all. And we need it because it's cost effective. We need it because it's fast. We need it because it has all sorts of benefits, including more dollars into our communities. So I'll just sum up uh, the presentation that Timothy and I have gave, given with two points that are on this next slide. Um, just to be really clear, we need fast, affordable local solar to meet our climate goals and utilities lie about solar to protect their shareholders. Thanks very much.